George Dillman was a, profess a professional photographer for 10 years. He was a firefighter and paramedic for 14 years. He was an auxiliary police officer with an Arkansas Police Department for 14 more years and eight years on their SWAT team. He was an adjunct police sniper instructor at the Arkansas Law Enforcement Training Academy. He has competed in virtually every venue uh, in competition firearm shooting and really an outstanding gentleman. I think you're going to enjoy his presentation today. George? Thank you, Warren. I appreciate you all coming here. I want to make sure that you can hear me. Uh, Gary, can you hear me in the back? Excellent, excellent. First of all, I would like to say that uh, my interest in World War II firearms stemmed from my family. My father and all of his friends were World War II veterans. I was raised around these guys, got a tremendous respect for what they did, became interested in the history of that period of this country. I would also like to tell you that all of these firearms up here have been checked. They are unloaded. However, we will observe all the uh, firearm safety rules and there is no ammunition for any of these firearms in this room. So if you're a little bit uneasy about that, be rest assured they have been checked. Now the title of this presentation is Rifles and Carbines of World War I and World War II. You may be asking yourself, why in the world are we going to consider both of those wars? Well the fact is that back in the 1890s we had some very important developments. We had three men that influenced those developments. Paul Mauser, Ferdinand Manlicher, and John C. Grind. Now certainly there were other designers that were influential as well, but these three men shaped the destiny of firearms used in warfare during this period. Paul Mauser designed the Mauser bolt-action rifle, which has been the most successful bolt-action rifle in the world. It's still being used today in hunting form. Ferdinand Manlicher designed another type of firearm, the Manlicher firearm, that was not as successful. However, Ferdinand Manlicher, even back in the 1890s, was experimenting with the concept of semi-automatic firearms. And his concept and his research actually influenced John C. Grand. Now, John C. Grand, of course, developed the M1 Grand rifle, which we will cover in detail later on. Some of the important transitions that we must consider that happened in the 1890s was a transition from black powder to smokeless powder. Black powder leaves a tremendous residue in the bore and in the action and affects reliability of these firearms. So when they transitioned to smokeless powder, it got rid of that residue. But it also upped the chamber pressures that the firearms were operating at. So they had to have a new stronger action, a new design. That was where Paul Mauser came in. He developed a new rifle for these smokeless powder rounds. A second transition was from blunt nosed bullets that were aerodynamically inefficient, but at the time they were thought to be more effective, to a pointed Spitzer bullet, which was developed in Germany. These bullets were much more aerodynamically efficient, and they traveled further and had as much destructive power as the old pointed bullets because of their increased velocity. Again, we get back to the reliable bolt action repeaters using this new am ammunition, Paul Mauser, Ferdinand Manlicher. One of the big things, though, that uh, Paul Mauser did is he designed a new clip reloading system that sped up reloading these rifles tremendously. And as we examine these different farms, you'll see that being used again and again and again. A lot of these designers took, mixed and matched different design components from different manufacturers and came up with their own designs, a hybrid design, if you will. Finally, of course, we had transition from bolt actions to semi-automatics and then finally fully automatic firearms toward the end of World War II. Now, we have a lot of firearms to cover. When I first talked to uh, uh, the folks here at the museum about the presentation, they asked me how many farms I was going to be talking about. I said probably 30 to 40. I, just, I could hear this distinct pause on the end of the line. <laughs> I said, you do have 45 minutes. So, 
I was able to cut that down to simply 21. So we still have a lot of ground to cover. So in rapid fire sequence, we'll start. The first one we're going to talk about is the Carabiner 98K. This was a standard military firearm used by Nazi Germany during World War II. This is the ultimate design culmination of Paul Mauser's efforts. It incorporated a tremendous number of his features, the clip loading system, the box magazine system, the uh, very strong bolt, the claw extractor, a lot of different things that were used on this rifle. It was made from 1935 to 1945 by 10 different manufacturers and there were only over 14 million of these produced during that time period, a tremendous number. They were issued to the Air, which is German for Army, the Luftwaffe, which is German for Air Force, and the Kriegsmarine, which is German for Navy. This is a top view of the Car 98K action, and you'll notice several different features of this action. First of all, the bolt, the extractor down on this side of the bolt. You have a front receiver ring, which holds the barrel, a rear receiver ring, the bolt handle, the bolt shroud, and the safety, which is right here. Now, several things that you'll notice here. First of all, some markings. Right up at the front of the front receiver ring is a marking AR. Germany used different codes for different manufacturers to try to throw the allies off as to who was making what. AR was the code for Mauser at the Borgeswald, Germany plant. Then you see the marking 41. That's actually the year that it was manufactured, 1941. Then you'll start seeing some numbers here, 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 so on and so forth. Those are actually the serial number. Back in 1941 and before that, and really up to 1942, Germany had the luxury, and Germans being Germans, they serial numbered every part on this rifle. Even the action screws were serial numbered. <laughs> That's amazing. By 1942, they figured out, you know, we really don't have time to be doing this anymore. <laughs> so they started cutting back, taking shortcuts, increasing their production. Now, this area right here is part of the clip loading system, and I'll show you that now. This is what made the Mauser rifle so effective. It had a five round clip. This is the clip part. These are the five rounds of ammunition. It fit down into the slot in the rear receiver ring right here. To load the rifle, the soldier would open the bolt, put the clip in the clip slot, place his thumb on top of the cartridges, and simply push the cartridges down into the box magazine. Then all he had to do is close the bolt and the clip was pushed out of the way. He didn't even have to remove the clip manually. He just pushed the bolt home. So this made for a very rapid and efficient uh, reloading system. Now the Americans actually first ran up against this clip reloading system in the Spanish-American War because the Spanish were some of the first ones to use the Mauser uh, rifle system. And it uh, literally changed the way Americans looked at uh, military firearms. They were using the Craig Jorgensen rifle at the time with black powder. The Spanish were using the new Mauser system, clip loading and smokeless powder. And to say the least, the Americans got taught a lesson. <laughs> now the Carabiner 98K, Carabiner actually started in stem for carbine, the K stood for Kurtz, which was short. You'd think this was a rifle, but in reality it was a shortened version of the Model 98. But they did discover that uh, they needed they needed to use a carbine type system. Now, German firearms were also marked on the right buttstock with property marks. Anytime you see a German firearm from World War II, look on that area, and you'll see something that looks like this. That L right there indicates that that particular rifle was issued to the Luftwaffe. If it's an H, it was Army. If it was M, it was Navy. Now, getting back to that carbine. The Gewehr 3340 is a carbine that they decided they needed. The Germans were a little bit indecisive about the use of carabiner or carbine and Gewehr, which meant rifle. For some reason, they call this a rifle when in reality it was a carbine. 
Of course, they call the rifle a carbine. So whether they did this to throw the Allies off, we don't know. Because I know the Germans couldn't have been that confused. <laughs> this particular rifle was made from 1940 to 1942 in Czechoslovakia. When Germany overran Czechoslovakia and any other country for that matter, they took over their armament industries, used them for their own purposes. This rifle was actually made by Czechoslovakia in 1933, but the Germans converted it for use for their own purposes. It was issued to the Gebirgstruppen. Those were the famed Alpine or mountain troops that the Germans had. One of the unique features about this rifle is this metal plate right here. The reason this metal plate is here is this rifle was actually designed to be used as a climbing stick. The, the Germans would actually grasp it by the muzzle and use it as a climbing stick or a climbing aid. So they reinforced the stock for that purpose. It has all the other traditional uh, Mauser features. All of the German rifles were chambered in the 7.92 by 57 Mauser cartridge. That's commonly in the United States called the 8 millimeter Mauser. They are one and the same cartridge, but the technical description is 7.92 by 57. The markings on this particular rifle are as such. Again, you'll see some of the designations. DOT meant the Braun factory in Czechoslovakia. Obviously, 1942 is the date of manufacture. We have the model number down here, Gewehr or G3340. And then over here, we see the serial number, 851C. Now, the Germans used a rather unique numbering system. What they would do at the beginning of the year is they would start with serial number one. They would go up to 9,999, and then they would start over again with serial number one. But they would add a suffix to that serial number, A. So, every time you see a letter here, it indicates the what, uh, uh, 10,000 series of rifles were made. So the serial number always has a letter unless it was in the first 10,000 rifles made. The next country we're going to uh, consider is Japan. Now the J Japanese made the Arasaka rifle. The uh, Type 99 was actually based on the Type 38, which was based on the Type 30. You get the impression it goes back to the 1890s. So these were gradual modifications of rifles. One of the big changes that they made was they increased the caliber because of their exploits in China in the 1930s from 6.5 to 7.7 .7 millimeter. There were other countries that did that as well. Most of the countries that fought during World War II ended up with calibers between 29 and 31 caliber. It happened that the 7.7 .7 was the machine gun round that they were using, so it was a convenient switch to that. This is one of the very first Type 99 rifles made. It's called the Type 99 Long Rifle. Now the Long Rifle was literally that. It was the same length as a Type 38. Now, I'm six feet tall. You can see how high this rifle stands up on me. Then you take the bayonet, and mount it, and now you have a really long rifle. Now you can imagine the average short Japanese soldier. He's going to be down here about like this, all right? So the Japanese made very few of these Type 99 rifles, uh, the long rifles. As a matter of fact, they only made about 38,251 of them. The reason was they decided, like other countries, like Germany, that what we can do is shorten this rifle, come to a compromise, and make it where everybody can use it. The cavalry, the infantry, so on and so forth. So they did that. The Japanese were extremely innovative when it came to their designs. One of the things that they did on the Type 99 rifles is they introduced the concept of a dust cover. This fit over the bolt and slid along the action the idea was when the bolt was closed, it would keep out mud, snow, dust, and that sort of thing and make it more reliable. A lot of these innovations, though, weren't practical. The dust covers had a tendency to rattle. So typically what the Japanese troops would do is they would take the dust covers off and, like most GIs, throw them away. So it's very rare to find these rifles with the original dust covers in place. 
Then they had an innovative rear sight. This is the rear sight in the folded down position, but you'll notice these two wings or arms that are sticking out on either side here. When it was folded up and those wings folded down, it turned into an anti-aircraft sight. Now that was another really dubious type of development because you can imagine a Japanese soldier trying to sight along this arm here, firing at a fast-moving low uh, aircraft as it went by. That was dropped, incidentally, in 1944, because like the Germans, they got a little bit pressed for time and materials. Another thing that they did is they introduced the concept of a monopod. Now, when fired from the prone position, the Japanese soldier could fold this monopod down like that and use it as a support. That again was dropped later on in the war. Not that practical. The one thing that the Japanese did that was eminently practical though, and it's very difficult to see, but they chrome-plated the bores of their rifles. They were the first military uh, nation to do that. What that did is it protected the bore in the harsh jungle environments that these firearms were used in. So most of the time you see a Japanese Arasaka rifle and they all have good bores, even though they were using corrosive ammunition in a humid climate. It wasn't because they cleaned them well. This is an example of the Type 99 rifle, and you can see the difference in length. Basically what they did is they just cut the barrel down. They added a full length handguard. But this particular Type 99 rifle is not really a Type 99. Rather, it's a Type 2 paratrooper rifle. In 1943, the Japanese had paratroopers in both the Army and the Navy. They were looking for a rifle that could be easily jumped with. So, a rifle like that, as everybody that's parachuted on the military can tell you that's rather difficult to jump with. So what they did is they came up with a very good system of being able to actually take the rifle apart into two pieces very quickly. They did that with a quick disconnect sling. They would unscrew this small bale. Pull the rifle apart. That quick, that simple. Equally simple to put it together. It was a really effective system. I'm surprised it hadn't been used more in the West. It also turns out that the Arasaka rifle actions are some of the strongest designs in the market or in the, in the world. Uh, after the war, the NRA did tests on these different types of rifles and they actually overloaded a cartridge to the point to where it was full of fast burning powder all the way to the top, compressed, uh, fitted the bullet into it, pulled the trigger. It actually melted the brass cartridge case in the chamber. The rifle did not come apart, and in fact, the rifle was still operable. So that gives you an idea of the strength of this particular action. Next, we're going to go to Italy. Now, you remember Ferdinand Manlicher. Italy was the only country to maintain the Manlicher type of action. And while the Manlicher actions were used extensively by different countries during World War I, Italy decided to hang on to it while everybody else moved on to a variation of the Mauser system. The rifle that we're going to look at is the M1941. Now, what makes the Manlicher action different? Primarily in the way the bolt is situated in the action. You notice that the rear receiver ring is not a ring, rather it's split down the middle right here. Also notice that the bolt handle is in front of the rear receiver ring. There's an advantage and a disadvantage to this. First of all, because of this split rear receiver ring, the action's not as rigid, it's not as strong. The upside is, with the bolt handle being here, if the locking lugs break loose in the action because of a, a stoppage or a, a bore obstruction, then theoretically, the bolt handle would come back, hit the rear receiver ring, and stop it before it went into the shooter's forehead. So that was a good thing. <laughs> the main difference in the Mandelaker action, though, was in the way it was clip-fed. What we have here is the Mandelaker clip. The difference between the Mandelaker clip and the Mauser clip was, number one, the Mandelaker clip, as designed by Carcano, 
or modified bar cartano, it held six rounds instead of five. To load it, you open the bolt, place the clip in the top of the action, and you push the rounds and the clip into the bolt action. Then you close the bolt to chamber the first round. After you shot the uh, fifth round and chambered the sixth, the clip would actually fall out of the bottom of the rifle through this hole right here. So that was a little bit different. Big disadvantage to this, actually two of them, the first being that unless you had your rounds and clips, that turned this into a very hard to load single shot. The second disadvantage was you had a big hole in the bottom of your rifle. Under combat conditions, all kinds of dirt, trash, mud, so on and so forth would get up inside the action, cause malfunctions. So that was the disadvantage of the Carcano system, the Mannlicher system. Since Italy had a full-length rifle, they also made a carbine version of it. That's this right here. This was issued primarily to paratroopers and cavalry people. The one thing that they did is they incorporated a folding bayonet into the design to where they didn't have to carry that as a separate piece of equipment. So, very short, very light. But I tell you the truth, if I was given this and told to go to war, I'd really question whether I wanted to do that or not with this particular weapon. Looks more like a child's toy. Now we're going to go on to one of the most famous firearms of all time. The SMLE number one Mark III, Mark III Star. This was a British weapon that was uh, manufactured from 1907 to 1974. That's an extremely long time period for a military farm to be produced. It was made in Britain, in Australia, and in Italy. It was chambered for the 303 British, which is basically a slightly oversized 30 caliber round. And over seven million of these things were made. Tremendously effective. The example that we have is a rather rare variation made in Lithgow, Australia in 1927. The thing that makes this pretty rare is the fact that there were very few rifles produced between the two world wars. So this is a nice example of that. Also, this is a Mark III instead of a Mark III Star. Military uh, tacticians had a huge fear of troops wasting ammunition. So all the early bolt action rifles had some way that they could actually cut the magazine off and turn it into a single shot. The idea being you'd load the rifle and then throw the cutoff, magazine cutoff into position and then use it as a single shot until you needed those extra rounds in the magazine. During World War II, around 1917, the British decided again, hey, we don't have the time, we really need the ammunition to be shot, so they dropped that magazine cutoff. But Australia continued to produce it in that form. Now, it had a 10-round detachable box magazine, twice as many rounds as the Mauser. But it did use the Mauser-type clip system in a slightly modified version. The other difference was the fact that this rifle actually cocked on closing. When you close the bolt, that cocked the firing piece. Mausers, it actually cocks the firing piece when you open the bolt. Now, the idea was that this would make the rifle faster to fire. That's always been very debatable, but it is a fact that the trained English soldier could fire up to 50 rounds a minute from this particular bolt-action rifle. So it was very effective, as the Germans found out during World War I. This was the type of rifle that was used during North African campaign. It was there at Dunkirk and so on and so forth. So long distinguished history of the uh, SMLE. Incidentally, the term SMLE gave the British soldiers a really good name to call this. They called it the Smelly. <laughs> In the mid-1930s, the British decided that they could actually improve on the SMLE's design. So they came up with what they call the number four Mark I. Now this particular model that I'm going to be showing is a number four Mark I-T. I'll explain the difference in a minute. But it was actually manufactured from 1941 to 1960. 
again, a long production period. It was made in Britain, certainly, but you notice that it was also made by the Savage Arms Company in the United States. In addition, it was made in Canada at the Long Branch factory. The T designation was actually the designation for the sniper rifle version. You'll see that they almost made five million of these number four Mark I's. But out of that five million, only 25,000 of them were made in the sniper version. They would select rifles at the factory for accuracy, and then they would actually send the factory, uh, the, the rifles, to the Holland and Holland gun firm in London. And the Holland and Holland company actually converted these one by one by hand to the sniper version. Very, very high quality accurate weapons, extremely rugged. One of the big differences also between the number one Mark IV or three and the number four Mark I is the bayonet. This is the earlier bayonet and when Britain decided to simplify things, they went to a spike bayonet. So big, big difference. The soldiers weren't crazy about these because these could be used for a variety of uh, different things. They could dig with them, open cans with them, so on and so forth. These were basically good for one thing, actually two. You could use them for tent pegs. <laughs> The next rifle we're going to talk about is the number five Mark I. Toward the end of the war, the uh, uh, Brits decided they needed a short carbine to use in the jungle environments in Southeast Asia. So they did come up with this short version right here. And they had several problems. They actually came out with it in 1945. So it was only made from 1945 to 1947. Like most carbines that were chambered for the full power rounds, the muzzle blast and the recoil was terrific. The troops were not crazy about this, but it suffered a more serious problem, something that they never tracked down exactly why it was happening. They were never able to fix it. This rifle exhibited a trait called the Wandering Zero. You could take this rifle to the range and zero it, get the uh, sights lined up, bullet impact right, go back the next day, fire it again, and it would have a totally different zero. They never figured out why that happened, so they ended up dropping the rifle. Now to get back to the slide I just had up, on all the Savage produced uh, number four Mark I's, we had that marking right there, U.S. property. Now why in the world if Savage was building rifles for Britain, would they have that marked on the rifle? The reason was these rifles were built prior to the U.S. earlier in World War II, and officially the United States was a neutral country. So, being neutral, we could only lend or lease, that ought to ring a bell, the Lend Lease Act, these rifles to the British. So to make it abundantly clear to the Germans that we weren't siding with the British, we marked them U.S. property. <laughs> Another famous rifle. I'm sure many of you have seen the movie Enemy at the Gates, The Siege of Stalingrad. This rifle was featured in that movie. This is a Mosin Nagant Model 9130. Again, based on a model of 1891, changed in 1930, hence the uh, designation 9130. Fitted with a telescopic sight, this rifle had several interesting characteristics, not the least of which the fact that only over 17 million of these things were made. These were used all over the world and are still being used all over the world. Tremendous. Uh, number of these made, but only about 180,000 of them were made in the sniper version. They were made at the Heswick and uh, Tula arsenals. It was chambered for the 762 by 54R or rimmed cartridge, Soviet cartridge. It's still being used today. Uh, matter of fact, they're probably shooting off quite a few of them in a place called Libya right now. Um, tremendous rifle. Very, very rugged, very accurate. It doesn't look like much. In fact, it's downright ugly. 
But the fact is, I've taken my sniper rifles out of my collection, test shot them at the range. This outshot every sniper rifle that I have, American, British, and German. So they worked. Being a rim cartridge, they had to modify the clip loading feature a little bit. You'll see that right here. But again, we still see Paul Mauser's influence. It's often been said that of the World War II bolt action firearms, the Germans made the best hunting rifle, the Americans made the best target rifle, but the British made the best battle rifle. And we did make a good target rifle. The model 1903, super action. This was actually based on Paul Mauser's designs. This was a direct result of our interaction with the Mauser rifles uh, during the Spanish-American War. We copied the Mauser rifle, what it boiled down to. In fact, we copied it so closely that Paul Mauser sued the United States, and for a number of years, the United States had to pay the Mauser company a royalty for every 1903 that was made. It was made by Springfield Army, Rock Island, and lastly by Remington. A total of 2,244,000 of these were made. But only 11,000 of these were made in a match configuration such as this. This dates to the 1930s. These rifles were beautifully crafted at Springfield Armory. They were hand fitted, polished, had specially selected barrels that had what they call a star gauge uh, uh, measurement made on the bores. Uh, just simply absolutely astoundingly accurate rifles. These were effective out to a thousand yards in the proper hands with iron sights. So again, we used the uh, uh, clip system with Paul Mauser, but we also threw in one little more wrinkle here. You remember on the Mannlicher Carcano from Italy, the bolt handle being in front of the receiver ring? What we did is we added, actually added what was called a safety lug to the bolt right here that rode in front of this rear receiver ring. So that acted as the same type of safety feature as the Mannlicher Carcano. One little feature there. Next thing we're going to look at is a model of 1917. What happened during World War I is the British were running short of firearms. The British contacted the Remington Arms Company to build a rifle for them because they weren't producing enough for their own troops. They came out with what was called the Pattern 14, which was chambered in 303 British. That's basically this rifle. But when the U.S. got into the war, they found out they were woefully short of Model 1903 rifles. So they went to Remington and said, convert that Pattern 14 rifle to 30-06, make as many of them as you can as fast as you can. As a result, between Remington and the Remington Eddystone plant in Winchester, an astounding 2,200,000 of these rifles were made in one year. Imagine that. Imagine that. So as famous as the Model 1903 is, there were actually far more of the Model 1917 in U.S. troops' hands in the European theater. So this is a very, very sturdy, accurate rifle. Again, it uses the Paul Mauser clip feeding system. Now, a little bit of trivia about the Model 1917. Do you remember Alvin York, Sergeant Alvin York? Tremendous guy, great marksman, captured a lot of Germans single-handedly, got the Congressional Medal of Honor. It turns out that it's documented that Sergeant Alvin York unit was actually equipped with Model 1917s. There's always been a big debate as to whether he did his marksmanship uh, feats with Model 1917 or the Model 1903. It's said that Sergeant Alvin York did not like the aperture rear sight of the Model 1917. So he actually traded it for a Model 1903 Springfield. That was what he actually used for his marksmanship feats. Truth or fact, fiction, who knows? Alvin York never owned up one way or the other. <laughs> As I mentioned, Remington continued to produce the uh, Model 1903. 
Uh, we knew we were going to end up in World War II, so what happened was the uh, U.S. contacted Remington Arms and asked them to produce the Model 1903. They actually took the Rock Island tooling and a lot of the receivers and parts from Rock Island, which had been sitting idle for years, and Springfield Armory was actually getting involved in production of the M1 Grand. So Springfield was out of the uh, business making Model 1903s. So Remington got these rifles, they started producing them. They were exactly the same as the original uh, Rock Island Arsenal Model 1903s. But almost immediately Remington began to work on different ways to modify the rifle to make it more efficient to produce. Eventually they modified it so much that they had to change the name of it. They changed it to the Model 1903A3. And then in 1943, since the uh, United States was so unprepared to go to war, we didn't have a good sniper rifle. They developed the Model 1903A4, which was a sniper version. Now you notice production cap uh, capacities here. Um, they made about 985,000 of these. And, uh, but only 29,000 of them were the Model A4 uh, type rifles with a scope. These were basically off the shelf components. This was a thrown together ad hoc sniper rifle. The mount was made by Redfield. The scope was made by Weaver. It was a Weaver 330C scope. In fact, the original scopes that went on the early rifles had the commercial markings because they literally pulled them right off the retailer's shelves. It was a good rifle, it was an effective rifle, but certainly not the best sniper rifle of the war. If anybody saw Saving Private Ryan, you saw this action uh, rifle in action on the silver screen. Now the Model 1903A3 continued to be issued to the troops. And the thing that really gets confusing about this is when you look at a Model 1903A4, it's actually marked 1903A3. So why did they do that? That was a strange thing. The idea was that after they built up the 03A4 and it didn't meet accuracy requirements, they could actually pull the scope off, put the iron sights back on it, and convert it back to a 1903 action. Now that's strange, but you'll find almost all the 1903A4s marked A3s. So. Getting back to the A3, why were they issued? What would happen, number one, we didn't have enough M1 Grand rifles to go around. Number two, the uh, O3A3s were issued to the infantry scouts. Now they had the unenviable job of finding enemy targets. And once they located those targets, the idea was to fire at them with tracer ammunition which you see loaded into the rifle here. That would designate where the rest of the infantry would fire at that particular target. The problem was, is that while the tracer rounds were coming into the German target or the Japanese target, the enemy could see exactly where those tracers were coming from. from guess where they show, uh, directed their fire? Yeah, at the scout. So this was not a fun job to have. The other reason that they issued the uh, 1903 A3s was because at the time there was not a convenient way to use the M1 rifle as a grenade launcher. So the 1903A3s typically had this kit issued to them. You see the grenade launcher which attached to the muzzle. You had your cartridges which were actually blank cartridges which would propel the rifle grenade out to a target. They had a rubber slip-on recoil pad because the uh, recoil from firing these grenades was tremendous. Then finally they had the different types of grenades. Here you have the fragmentation grenade and a uh, grenade launcher adapter and then an anti-tank grenade. Now before any of you call the alcohol, tobacco, farms and explosives people and tell them that I have grenades at my house, let me assure you all the explosive components have been removed from these. They're inert. So please don't do that. <laughs> Here we actually see the uh, grenade launcher attached to the muzzle of the 1903A3 with fragmentation grenade and the adapter attached to it. 
one of the big, big problems that they would have is that sometimes these uh, soldiers would get excited and they would actually fire a round of ball ammunition instead of a blank to propel that grenade with disastrous consequences. Not a good thing to do. Next thing we're going to talk about are the semi-automatic weapons. The SVT-38 was the Russians' first attempt at producing a uh, semi-automatic rifle. Again, it was 7.62 by 54 rimmed uh, that it fired. It had a 10-round removable box magazine and a two-piece stock. It had some real severe problems. It was weak and it was unreliable. It was only made for two years, 1939 to 1940 and it met its baptism of fire in the Winter War of 1939-40 in Finland. This particular rifle has an interesting history. It actually was captured by the Finns from the Russians and put into the Finns' own arsenal. That SA in a box there is the Finnish Army property mark. So this rifle's been there and done it. What it did result in, though, was the Russians developing the SVT-40, which was a rather successful uh, semi-automatic rifle design. When the Germans ran into it on the Eastern Front, they used that rifle as much as possible. You'll find a lot of pictures of German soldiers that are out carrying the SVT-40s. So they decided they were going to develop their own rifle. The result was this, the G-41. It was made only for two years, 41 through 43, had some significant problems. Not the least of the fact which it was heavy, it was clumsy, it was muzzle heavy, but most importantly, it used a gas operating system which did not work well. It was called the bang operating system. It used a cone on the front of the muzzle here to trap the gas, go back against a circular piston which surrounded the barrel to actuate the action. Didn't last long. What the Germans did was they took the G-41 and came up with the G-43, where they actually outright copied the gas system from the Tokarev rifle. Nice, effective weapon. Built from uh, 43 through 45. Uh, it was actually used post-war by the Czechoslovakians. It had an interesting feature. Every one of these had a rail machined into the side of it here. And what that rail was for was it could actually be turned into a sniper rifle by simply sliding on a scope, locking it into place. So that made a real handy little, uh, little sniper rifle. Fairly reliable, but the accuracy was not on the par with what was needed at the time. So in that respect, it was only semi-successful. In World War I, the U.S. came up with the idea that it needed a semi-automatic semi rifle too. So this is the United States' first attempt. This was called the M1903 Mark I. Essentially, a fellow named Patterson came up with a device that was simply a small pistol that replaced the bolt in the rifle, slid into the action, had a 40-round magazine. It fired a uh, 30 caliber pistol-powered uh, cartridge. Rather weak cartridge, but it did give the rate of fire that was necessary. The problem was, after they made 65,000 of the so-called automatic pistol caliber 30 model of 1918, the war was over. <laughs> so, here they had 145,000 rifles, 65,000 Pedersen devices, so our government, being the government that it is, we destroyed them. <laughs> Never issued in combat. As a result, there are very, very few Pedersen devices left in existence today. I asked Warren whether we have one here at the museum, and he said no, which is a real shame. They're only like $81,000 if you can find them. We would take one. Next rifle we'll consider is a rather rare rifle. It's called the Model 1941 Johnson. This was designed by a fellow named Melvin Johnson. And uh, Melvin Johnson was an interesting character. He was a Boston lawyer 
and a major in the Marine Corps Reserve. In the 1930s, the M1 Grand was uh, suffering some significant problems and came under a great deal of criticism through the general press. Even the NRA criticized it. Melvin Johnson thought he could do better, so he designed this rifle. It was not successful in the fact that uh, after much testing, it was found to be somewhat inferior. Beside that, the M1 Grand was already in production. But an interesting thing occurred, which would never happen today. Congress actually convened and went out and test fired the M1 Grand in the 1941 Johnson. <laughs> so you can imagine the senators out on the firing range trying to decide which rifle was best. Never happened today. The other thing that was very unusual about this rifle, it was recoil operated. All the rest of these uh, semi-automatic rifles that we're looking at were gas operated. This was a recoil operated weapon. He did manage to sell some to the Dutch, and they were to be used in the Dutch East Indies. However, by the time the Dutch was ready to take uh, possession of these, the Japanese had already overrun the Dutch West Indies. So, Melvin Johnson, being a Marine, went to the Marines and talked them into buying some of them. One of the unique features about this rifle is you could actually depress an indent right here and take the barrel out. So it broke down. It made an ideal paratrooper rifle for the Marine paratroopers. Interestingly enough, it was also acquired by the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA. The OSS being the Office of Strategic Services. Apparently, the CIA had a number of these in store, and these were actually issued to the invaders of Cuba during the Bay of Pigs. So this rifle has a really interesting history. Being recoil operated, the other problem with it was that uh, it wouldn't work with a regular bayonet, because when you add weight to the rifle barrel that recoils, then the rifle wouldn't work. So he came up with a, a special bayonet. One of the big things that was a tremendous advantage on this rifle, though, was the fact that it had a 10-round rotary magazine. The big problem with the M1 Grand, as we'll look at here in just a second, was that you loaded it with eight rounds, and then, until you fired the last round, you couldn't reload it. On this particular rifle, you could actually load rounds five at a time with a stripper clip, or one at a time through a side loading gate, even with the round in the chamber and the bolt closed. Getting back to the bayonet problem, that's the bayonet that he came up with. Most unusual bayonet that the U.S. has ever had. The Marines hated it. They called it the tent peg. Here's a picture of it actually attached to the muzzle. Next thing we'll consider is the M1 carbine. Great little guns really common. They should be. They made darn near uh, six million of them. That figure up there, five million five hundred fifty-one thousand, are only the M1 variants. In addition, they made an M2 full automatic version and an M3, which was an infrared sniper version for use at night. So a tremendous number of these made. This carbine, to me, best represents America's potential for manufacturing and adaptability. When you look at who made these things, you'll see a lot of interesting names here. Inland, Division of General Motors, Winchester, they were the only actual firearms manufacturer involved in the firearm, uh, manufacture of this firearm. You'll see Underwood Elliott Fisher, National Postal Meter, even IBM got in on the act. And finally, my favorite down here at the bottom, the Rockola Manufacturing Company. That's the same one that made the jukeboxes. Very adaptable, tremendous testimony to American ingenuity and adaptability. This particular model is the M1A1. It has a folding stock. If you saw the uh, movie Band of Brothers, you saw that being used. This was issued primarily to paratroopers. In original condition, these carbines are extremely rare. And this is an original, first model M1A1. This is the tail end of production. This is actually a 7 million serial number Winchester. 
This is the final culmination of design in 1945. Now you'll notice that this particular firearm has a bayonet lug on it. You'll actually see the first model which had a narrow barrel band, the second model which had a wide barrel band, and then you'll see this, the wide barrel band with the bayonet lug and the bayonet. Almost every carbine you see today will have a bayonet lug on it, but they weren't built that way except for two manufacturers, that's Inland and Winchester. They actually added those in 1945 just before the war ended and virtually, well, probably none of these actually saw combat in that original factory uh, 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 factory uh, condition like that. Configuration. Yeah, configuration, good, thank you. <laughs> if you go to Washington, D.C., you look at the Marine Corps Memorial, tremendous statue of the raising of the flag at Iwo Jima. You look at the M1 carbines that those Marines are carrying in that statue, every one of them have bayonet lug. One little tiny minor technical glitch in that statue. That's not possible. They were using carbines that either had that barrel band or that barrel band, but no bayonet lugs. The final weapon that we'll be considering, I've saved the best for the last, is the M1 Grand. General George S. Patton said this was the best battle, battle implement ever devised, and he was right. This helped win the war. It had its deficiencies. I've already mentioned the eight-round monobock clip that loaded into it, and basically, um, basically, you had to fire the eighth round before you could reload it. Now this particular M1 Grand is very, very special. This is called a gas trap Grand. From uh, the gas trap Grands were made from uh, August 1937 to August of 1940. There were only roughly over 51,000 of these made. Virtually every one of these were converted to the later configuration called gas port. In fact, there are only about 24 of these that it were in original condition left today. This is one of those. What's the difference between a gas port and a gas trap? You'll notice that the muzzle on this actually has a cap that goes over the muzzle. You remember the uh, G41 rifle that Germany came up with? This operates in a very similar uh, manner. It also had similar problems and you had carbon buildup and such in this. It was hard to clean, tended to be somewhat less reliable. This was the reason that the Senators ended up shooting the M1 Grand Rifle. That was one of the major problems with this early rifle. So it was converted to what was called the gas port model. That's what the front end of an M1 Grand looks like. That's what you'll almost always see. If you see it the other way and it's for sale, buy it. So the important thing about this rifle, other than the fact that it's extreme rarity, is the fact that we actually have a provenance on this rifle. Very, very rarely do we realize or know who actually was issued a military weapon, where it was used, what campaigns it was used in. This is the exception to that rule. This particular rifle was issued to Private Max Bryan in Panama in 1943. Private Max Bryan was a member of the 551st Parachute Infantry Battalion. Their job down there in Panama was to invade Martinique in the Caribbean. Now who would have thought? It turned out that Martinique had a governor who was allied with Vichy France. And as such, he was very sympathetic to the German cause and the U-boat activity in that area was centered around Martinique. They were actually using that as a base of operations. So the 551st was tasked with invading Martinique. That was the worst kept military secret of all time. They publicized the fact, we're going to invade Martinique. <laughs> the Vichy governor decided maybe that's not such a good idea. He went back to France. <laughs> so the invasion never took place. The 551st then went to the United States to train. And then they were actually dropped into southern France, the invasion of southern France, 
Operation Dragoon. This rifle was there. They then went to the Maritime Alps, held off the Germans from crossing into northern France. This rifle was there. Lastly, they were thrown into the Battle of the Bulge. They participated in a six-day, six-night counteroffensive against the Germans. And during that counteroffensive, they lost 84% of their members, the second highest casualty rate of any unit in the United States Army. Immediately after that, the survivors were rolled into the 82nd Airborne, and Max Bryan brought this rifle home. So that's the history. That's the history. Very, very special rifle. Now, you'll notice something on the side of this rifle. Show it to you in just a second. What are all those dents? Looks like so. A woodpecker got a hold of that rifle. In fact, the eight round monoblack clip was unreliable if the bullets were not seated evenly into the clip. So the soldiers would take the clip, they would usually bang it against the side of their helmet, or in the case of Mac Private Max Bryan, he banged the points of the bullets against the side of the rifle. You can tell that he was under a lot of stress when he did this. He was in a big hurry. So that concludes our talk about uh, World War II rifles and carbines. I'd like to say, though, that all of these rifles and carbines, in fact, any tool used during war, is simply an inanimate object. It takes men, and now women, to pick those objects up and use them to defend our freedom. We certainly owe them a tremendous gratitude, a debt of gratitude. I would also like to say I'd like to give a special salute to the rifleman, this guy right here. Without him, we wouldn't be living the type of life that we live. So, here's to the grunt, the ground slogger, and the mudslinger. Thank you. <laughs>